Okay, you are ready to do your thing, Pam. Thank you. It is October 22nd, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee. And um, we have what appears to be a quorum. So I'm gonna go around and see if everyone can be heard and hear us. Uh, let's see, Mandy Johanneke. Present. Jennifer Taub. Uh, here. Freke Ette. Here. Here. Good. And Pat DeAngelis. Present. And Pam Rooney's here. So we are good to go. Uh, the agenda tonight, uh, there is no public hearing, uh, but there is general public comment. Uh, I see one person in the audience. I think everyone else went to the District 5 meeting tonight. That must be where they're all, they're all congregating. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for general public comment within the uh, on matters strictly within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. I will recognize you and when we call on you, uh, please identify yourself by stating your name and district or address. We typically do not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Would anyone in the audience like to speak? I don't see anyone raising a hand. And welcome, Stephanie. So we are going to jump into the action items. And um, that would be the solar bylaw. So we are working on the version V6 dated 2024 uh, 10-8 or 10-08. And these are with added staff comments. So it is uh, the document in the folder, I think, was put in there around the 15th. And, I'm, and I've asked Mandy if she would kindly scribe for us again. Thank you. Perfect. So as we left it, uh, let's see. We did start working on the staff review comments, and those have been incorporated incorporated as we went along. Um, I did put as an agenda item um, for the last time, but this time for sure, to just touch ba touch base on sections uh, 17.01 and 17.02, and then keep going to where we were previously. Uh, the reason that we were going to talk about that is staff had suggested that the section 17.00 might in fact be well served to um, sort of incorporate many of the of the items from 1702, the, the nexus statements, why are we doing this? So I actually had a document that um, I obviously hadn't haven't shared before tonight, but I was going to suggest that we could insert it uh, at the bottom of the current 17.00 and then come back to it next round so that you all have a chance to read it. Does anybody have an issue with doing that? Sorry, I, I can't you. raise my hand with the raise hand button. Um, okay, I have a ahead. question. Um, yeah. Are you suggesting to delete 1702 and add whatever you've got written into 1700 and then discuss it next meeting? Uh, essentially, yes, but I didn't want to lose anything and I certainly don't want to delete the numbers um, before we before we get to discuss it. Pat. I, I have a problem with the fact that I haven't seen it. I right. do not want the nexus statements removed. Right. In work that I've done, I've moved uh, the basic ne nexus statements about farmland and for forest, slimmed them down dramatically, mm -hmm. and integrated them into the farmland uh, section and forested section. So uh, I don't, I don't totally don't feel comfortable with having something plopped in there. That's my words, and, I, and then we haven't even seen it. 
Okay, so we because like... I could give I could plot my stuff in and I wasn't allowed to, so um, I, I'm not doing okay with this decision. Okay, it's not a decision. We're just talking about it. Um, so you had some material that you wanted to share with us, and in fact, we did get to see it uh, at the start of a meeting, and we're able to talk through it a little bit. I don't know of any other way to introduce uh, material without, you know, walking through it line by line, which is not the way to introduce. No, I, I hear that and I understand that, Pam. And you, we did not go through my material around on the nexus statements, et cetera. Uh, we did not go through the red line version that I offered. And I think that it's not that your idea in and of itself is a bad one. If it's a different font or something so mm -hmm. we can see in a different color, and I can get my stuff to you and you could do the same thing. But to do it now without having seen it feels like a waste. Of, I don't want to do that. Well, I'm going to look at Mandy and just uh, look at her for a recommendation because... Well, she's, she's only one person on the committee, so I'd like to hear what she says, but that's not a decision. I, I know, but I would... Whoops. I'd like to... Where'd I go? Oh, there it is. Uh, I would like to hear from a... a um, a procedural perspective because she tends to be better at procedural than I am. Than I am okay. That's okay. okay. And so I'm I'm looking at Mandy Johanneke, uh, she her, and wonder what she her says. Um. So it's tedious, but it needs done in an open meeting. So if Pam, if you have things you'd like to add to the purpose, you should talk about them. We can put it on the screen. I can try and type as you say it. Um, and then we can discuss it. If Pat has things she'd like to add to other sections, when we get to those sections, we discuss it. Um, if they're duplicate, duplicative of what people are trying to do in the purpose section or in the nexus statement, you should talk about it when we're at those sections and say, well, I would put it X, Y, Z, and that it is very tedious. Um, the, the only other option in a sense is to have everyone talk about it and then someone go back after a meeting and incorporate everything that was talked about into a completely new draft. But we've been doing the drafting here because no one's been we haven't been doing it that way. Um, we've been doing it at the meeting, which is slow and tedious, but what open meeting law requires. Okay, so, so um, and I appreciate Pat did have a lot of material that she had worked on. And I, I was thinking that we had gone through some of that though to, to incorporate the wording um, as we went. So I, I stand corrected. Uh, this is, uh, Pat, you've got your hand up. Well, I just, I just want to, uh, um, it seems to me, I, I hear what Mandy Joe is saying about procedure and it is what we are doing and it is what is required by open meeting law. My objection to adding it now is you had it ready and it could have been in the packet and we could have seen it. And I don't, you know, I... No, I was told very specifically that I can't put it in the packet ahead of time. I cannot put it in the packet yeah, ahead of time. Okay. It has to be. Like last night when Mandy brought her new char a a ARC charge, none of us had seen it. And that makes it very hard to discuss because you're seeing it for the first time. You're having to you know, think it through. Um, what I had hoped was that we could put a box around it and say, here's Pam's ideas for section 1700, which incorporates uh, as much as possible the 1702 nexus items. The staff had suggested that we try something like that and describe what it was that we're trying to protect, like carbon sequestration, climate resilience, uh, the economy, and community values. Those were the bullet items that they suggested we might want to incorporate into 1700. Uh, 
Um, if it were me, I would say the only way I can start processing is to actually get a chance to read it. I can tell you, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. That's what I was trying to avoid. Um, but I could tell you roughly what I've proposed. Go for it. Okay. All right. That's a green light. <laughs> Sorry. No, um, it's not. It's a yellow. A yellow. All right. Uh, so I took the the very first thing, and the and what staff had said is, sorry, folks, but but bylaws are for regulating. That's why we have that's why we have bylaws. Um, so I just wrote it a little differently, and maybe Mandy, you could blow this up so you can see what's currently here. So my suggestion was, is to say, the purpose of this article is to regulate the production of necessary solar energy by providing standards for the placement, design, construction, operation, monitoring, modification, and decommissioning of large-scale ground-mounted photovoltaic installations, LGPI, and battery energy storage systems, BESS, comma, that protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the community. Elements to be protected include, uh, and I'll just list the, the headings again, carbon sequestration, and I just basically took everything from below. Oh, she's actually typing. Wow. Uh, carbon sequestration, climate resilience, economy and access to local food, and community values. with a with a follow on sentence that says therefore the town of amherst which i think we have no we don't therefore the town of amherst has established the requirements regarding the installation of lgpis and bes on prime farmland farmland of statewide importance and prime forest lands and that's that's the gist of it Mandy, you're good. You're really good. <laughs> There's a whole dot. I didn't catch your entire list of stuff. Um, I, it was the same as yours. I mean, it's just right up from above. It's the exact same wording. Did I catch it all? Yeah, it looks like it. Well, there's nothing in here anymore about health and sa safety or public welfare. It's the second line down, Pat, from the top. It. I'm trying to find it. It's the second line down from the top. In the first paragraph. I oh, in the first Pat paragraph. What Pat saying is, are, is this paragraph still kept in your proposal or is this paragraph gone? Right. It, it is mostly there with the addition of uh, just a few words. And those were, uh, the, the purpose of this article is to, new wording, regulate the production of necessary solar energy by providing standards for, and, and, the, and the list, da 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 after best, it says that to protect the health, safety, and general welfare no. of the community. Elements to be protected include, and then our bullets below. What do you mean by community values? Community values. There was a survey done by GZA, and the master plan itself says, what do you value? People value open farmland, working farmlands. Uh, they appreciate forests for walking. Um, and okay. th those, are the, those are the community values. And I think that's what the original committee uh, was trying to capture as well.
So I have concerns about the reference to community values that aren't defined um, mm -hmm. in the bylaw in general, but you, you said you wanted us to be able to think about this, but yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I, that, that's one of my initially, one of my big problems with this, but if, if we want to talk about it later. Yes. I'd I'll like to talk to about think it about later. Those. Not now. Essentially it is the material from 17.02. So what I can do is now that we've talked about it, I will I will place that in the packet for next time. And you would then accompany this purpose statement would be deleting 1702 in its entirety? I think so, pretty much. I didn't actually go through... Um, and line by line decide if I needed to keep, wanted to keep something. Okay. I just added that into the note, so. Yeah, good. So again, I'll, I'll provide that word, Chris. So I wasn't gonna say anything, but um, this under applicability includes reference to systems of less than 250 kilowatts, roof mounted systems and solar parking canopies. So, there are aspects of applicability that aren't contained in the paragraph that Pam just um, added. So I just wanted to bring that to people's attention. I don't know that anyone is, it, do, do you feel there's a conflict or I, there wasn't any intention of getting rid of 1701? I see. Okay, so you're keeping 1701 and the things that you're deleting are in 1702. That's what you're hoping to. Right. Or trying okay. to trying to incorporate, right? I understand, thank you. Okay. Um, any any other comments or can we move on? Thank you for your patience. Um, at the same time, so we, um, okay, so now we can go on, we can go on back to where we left off before, which I believe was 1704. We have, let's see, we have our staff comments um, starting at 1704. And one of the suggestions was that we, uh, let's see, under number one, that we include a, so I, I had a suggestion and that is under number one, that we do bullets similar to the site plan list. It's just so much easier to read than a paragraph. Mandy has her hand raised. Oh, sorry, thank you, yep. Um, thank you, a, a couple of things. Are we not dealing with the comments before number one? Yeah. Um, Stephanie's here and then add an additional statement. I'll, I'll expand that one too. Sure. Um, and I also had some questions in those two paragraphs before number one. Are we skipping those? Sure, sure, let's do that. So that's what I thought we were supposed to do. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, maybe Stephanie, who took the notes here, um, could you talk a little bit, you and Chris, talk a little bit about this section being in rules and regulations? Let me just, I'm going to, um, so we have comments from different dates, and I just want to make sure that we're looking, because some, this got very, this got very confusing because we had comments that Chris and I had done as staff. Yeah. But then the review that was added was the one from the larger staff group. Those comments were, I think, May 28th. Um, I'm sorry, not May 28th, um, September 30th. So I just want to make sure that um, we're looking at some of the right comments. Um, so, so the first comment, I think, I'm sorry, the May 28th, those were from your meeting. And I just, I think Mandy Joe and I um, had typed up comments. I think actually those were my comments that I typed for your group for the CRC. 
So not looking at May 28th, I'm gonna go down to the next comment, which is September 30th, which is a staff comment. I just wanna make sure you're following me. <laughs> so Yes, so okay, is, that, is that associated with se section 17.04? This is 17. So I've gone back up to 1701 because I thought that's what you were just saying that you wanted to oh, go. Okay. To first. Um, we, we can't see that on the screen. <laughs> sorry. I was just realizing that I'm looking at my own screen, so I apologize. So uh, go down to the next comment. There you go. Uh, one. Yes, I think that one. Yes. Um, See, sorry, are you in, you're in 1700. Can you go down to 1701? Because I thought we were done with 1700, 17.0. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So this is the first comment in 1701 that staff had done collectively. And this was, we went back and looked at these few sections because you had made some edits that the staff hadn't seen. So they were just saying, um, Again, that you know, because you're regulating system of systems of a certain size, you want to be um, definitive of what you are regulating and not make references to the systems that you're not, because you make a reference here to systems of less than 250 kilowatt direct current, or you know, that these are not systems that you're regulating. And so the comment from staff was that why have something in that you're not regulating, just focus on what you are regulating. So um, I don't know that Chris was there for that particular comment. I can't remember. So Chris, I, I don't know if you have uh, other thoughts about that, but. I think sometimes it's helpful to put in um, reference to things that you're not regulating because that makes it clearer to whoever's reading it, what is really being regulated, but that's my my opinion. So I would, I would agree with with what I just heard. I had a couple uh, comments from folks in the community, and they just said it's it's important to remind people that you know can solar canopies and and rooftops are outside of the jurisdiction of this bylaw, and that would make people who you know are sort of unfamiliar with it um, more aware. Mandy has her hand up. Thank you. Um, two things as we go back to this one. Um, what happens if a solar parking canopy is larger than 250 kilowatt DC? Um, Cause it's a ground mounted system under LGPI definition. And then in the first sentence, it says we use the word section a lot, but in legislative drafting, when I think section, I think section is the section you are in, 1701. Should we be referring to this article as I think Pam did in the one above? Um, or should we say section 17 applies to? Um, oh, and, and call it. And we know we know obviously now that we have uh, University Drive is seventeen. Ours this numbering is going to be different anyway. Right. But should it say this article? In yeah yeah we even yeah. say that down yes. here this article down here yes good point let's change that. But I'd love to hear thoughts on. What about solar canopy, parking canopies above 250 kilowatt? I'm going to look at Chris and Stephanie. In my opinion, I think um, solar canopies in parking lots, even if they're over 250 kilowatts and over an acre, should be um, regulated separately. So I am, I don't know how to um, word that exactly, but I think parking canopies should be separate from um, ground-mounted solar. Could we just add or solar parking canopies of any size? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, what about, I guess, ground mount and roof mounted are different things. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Okay. Yeah, it's par parking canopy, canopy arrays because one one canopy is not going to be Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, I like that. And then we go down to, let's see, the provisions set forth in this article shall take precedent over all other articles. So I don't think we had, there was any comment on that. I think the only thing that staff was interested in adding is that at the end of this mm. sentence, you have, um, so it reads, the provisions set forth in this article should take precedence over sections of the zoning bylaw that may conflict in the regulations of LGPIs and BSS. Staff thinks you should add an associated BESS associated with LGPIs because you're not yeah. making this a standalone BESS bylaw. So great. Thank you. Add that language. Great. Can we move to section 1702? So here were the nexus statements. Um, now, I'm not ready to um, share what I have changed. I don't have that material pulled up. I would like us to skip section 1702 and move on and come back to it at our next meeting. That'd be fine with me. Anyone disagree? I don't see any hands. And I actually, I cannot see um, Councillor Ette in my screen, I only have like five people showing. So please let me know if you've got comments and I can't call on you. Okay, 1703, we did work through definitions pretty closely. And we did decide to keep the definitions here as opposed to pulling them all out and putting them in, what is it, Article 12? Yeah, um, except for, I think it was three. I'm sorry, what do you mean by three? We were going to pull oh. out battery energy storage system, large scale ground mount and small scale ground mount, I believe, um, yes. because of the article, because of table three. Yes. The need for, since they're going to get used in table three, the need for them to be in article 12. Yeah, thank you. And this has not done that yet, but. But you've highlighted, it says there are a couple yeah. that are, you know, as defined. If people want, I can pull them out and start putting in an article 12 change too, but it seems too early to do that yeah. at this point. Yeah, yeah, and that's time consuming. Yeah. Um, we have a new definition needed and wonder if that has been made available yet for Prime forests. No, I'm sorry, we have not been able to get that um, definition okay. yet, but I will make a note. Okay, we'll just keep checking as we go. Thank you. So heavy rain event that we've already talked about that. Um, was there anything else that needed attention here? We made many of these corrections. I had a question about the native, rated nameplate capacity. And there's something that comes up in one of the um, re requirements, submittal requirements. And my question is, is that not the same thing as rated name nameplate capacity? So I'll try to remember to bring that up when I get to it. Christine. Uh, just an aside, um, we understand that rated nameplate capacity is not what is generally um, produced by a, a panel, a solar panel, that it's actually something that is calculated in a factory based on a best best uh, situation. And you would not expect that um, degree of production to occur in an installation. It's actually much less. And I think the number of 14% sticks in my head. But in any event, rated nameplate capacity doesn't really mean what it sounds like. It's just uh -huh. something that is uh, generated from testing in a in a factory. Thank you. 
it, it does say here though the the maximum rated output which which is still true uh, it just may never exceed that it's kind of like gas mileage right mm -hmm. <laughs> they do really really well in the factory manda you got your hand up um thanks for bringing that up looking at that and small scale again um i think they need work um <laughs> Just, just a couple more tweaks. Large scale says on the ground and a minimum nameplate capacity of 250 kilowatt DC, uh, but doesn't say or more, <laughs> or greater. I think it needs to say or greater because under this 300 kilowatt DC wouldn't, wouldn't be a large scale ground mount. So I think yeah. it has to say or greater. Doesn't the word minimum imply that? Yeah, that's what I thought, the minimum. I don't know. Um, but when you look at small scale, it says has a minimum nameplate capacity of under 250. It's just, it, I guess it's a weird wording to me. So it's let's a, keep your, or let's keep your org reader. Oh, Chris. It should probably say something like has a, I just, has a maximum nameplate capacity of 250 kilowatts. I think that's what it's supposed to say, but we should For check the small on small scale. Yeah. Oh. Maximum nameplate capacity of 250 because anything over that is considered yep. large scale. And I don't want to complicate things, but is that a maximum based on what the factory says it can do, or is it that that? lower calculation of of actual i believe it's the factory number so i i guess i'm curious because a capacity this using of minimum and mass maximum versus just a rated name plate capacity of 250 or greater or a rated name capacity of under 250 because you get a number you don't have a range and so a minimum you know a ma a minimum name plate capacity of 250 but the number isn't 250 the numbers and and that's not a minimum frankly you know you've got a name my system has a name plate capacity of i think 900 and you know about 1 1 kilowatt dc maybe i don't know 10 kilowatt dc probably um that's its maximum it can't go above that but it's not its minimum capacity that depends on what the sun is shining mm -hmm. right the name the rated nameplate nameplate capacity is a maximum that can be produced under there it's not really a minimum right it's a rated capacity of some number and so the minimum maximum seems weird to me mm -hmm. I feel like it should say rated name cape, name plate capacity of something or greater or something or less than, you know, that this one would say. Something like that. That's right. I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody opposed to that. That makes sense to me. Great. And so that that has addressed the small scale, and that will go to another article. Um, but for now, it's going to sit right here. Um, did anyone have any concerns with the rest of those um, these definitions? Uh, Stephanie, we had the inconsistency of the term. Uh, soils and farmland of statewide importance. Those are those are described by um, NRCS soil surveys, right? Yes. So I think what they were saying was just have consistency of when you reference those um, to make sure that you're just consistent with the NRCS definition, if that's what you're referring to. Great. Yeah. Could we go back to prime farmland? I don't want to change its definition, but both prime farmland and soils of farmland and farmlands of statewide importance reference the same map. 
And mm -hmm. one says land designated as such by, and the other one sort of defines it instead of, I feel like prime farmland should also say land designated as such by to be consistent in those. Since that's, when you go to that map, that's that's the key color you're going to look for, I guess is the best way to, to say it. The prime farmland color or whatever. So you should think you want to see uh, under prime farmland, you want to see as um, at, not as defined, but as described by designated to, by. To mirror the language in solar, the right. start, start language in solar soils yeah. of state and farmlands of statewide importance. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Anybody questioning solar energy? <laughs> okay. Oh, we're at 17.04. Great. So this, this conversation may circle back to where we were a number of months ago, and that is that uh, there was a discussion about the submittal requirements being in a in a collective location where somebody wanting to develop goes to the source and understands the full parameters. And I think we heard we heard a couple of people say this, um, or at least one person, I think I copied it down. Uh, and that is that um, one of the questions that we may ought to keep in our heads is, is the bylaw complete so a solar developer can find all they need to know for their application? without having to search through the entire zoning code. Chris. I think we had said, um, and there was some discussion about this previously, that these submittal requirements should be in the rules and regulations. And I had objected to that initially, but I'm willing to go along with it now because I think it clears up a lot of things and it also gets this very large section out of the bylaw. But what we would end up with is that um, the submittal requirements would then be made into a separate section of the Zoning Board of Appeals Rules and Regulations and a separate section of the Planning Board Rules and Regulations. Mm. It could be that you know the Zoning Board doesn't have the same wording as the Planning Board, but they are um, they are the masters of their own rules and regulations. So you can't tell them what to put in their rules and regulations. I guess that that was my initial sort of hang up that I felt like it would be better to have all of these requirements sort of um, uniform. Um, but what we may end up with, if we put them in the zoning board rules and, re and regulations and the planning board rules and regulations, they could be slightly different, but probably in the end, that's not too important. So I'm currently agreeing with the idea of putting the submittal requirements in the rules and regulations and taking them out of the zoning bylaw. Mandy has her hand up. Mandy, thank you. So it will be no surprise that I've agreed with that in the past and I agree with it now, but um, what I was going to say is whether or not we agree with it, I would say let's, even if people say, maybe we should keep them in here and and we need that discussion um right now given that it has been reported that the house and the senate have reached an agreement on their on the climate bill that has solar siting stuff in it um it might be wise to skip this section completely for now till we see if that they actually come back into session to pass a bill and the governor signs it because of my understanding is that bill usurps any submittal requirements the towns may have. It's It would set a standard set of submittal requirements. And so I'm thinking for time efficiency purposes, we should wait to see, given that it was just reported they came out of conference with a bill, um, that maybe we should wait a meeting or two before we spend a lot of time on this section to see what happens with that bill. And then if it doesn't pass, come back to it. If it does 
wait to see what guidance is on what's going on with whatever passed, since this seems to be a big chunk of that bill. Uh, maybe Chris could answer this question. So even if even if the House and Senate come up with, with a bill and it gets passed, don't they then have to turn around and develop the rules and regs and the, you know, it's like then the regulatory process begins and, you know, the different agencies start developing their stuff. So it could be quite some time down the road um, before they get their act together on actually implementation regulations. I think that's true. Um, but the last time I looked at what was being proposed, um, the numbers were that the state was taking over control of anything over um, 25 megawatts, was it? And anything under 25 megawatts was going to stay with the municipality. So um, it, end, it may end up that the submittal requirements are in our hands anyway, because we don't really have in my opinion, a place that's large enough to have hmm. installation that's 25 megawatts or larger. We're going to be looking at the smaller installations. But I think so, Mandy's probably right that we should hold off on dealing yeah. with this so we know more about what the state is doing. Right. It, it was my understanding that we'd deal with the regulations, but that the state would set standard submittal requirements for all, not just those of over 25 megawatts. Again, I, I, I don't, the conference bill hasn't been seen yet, I don't think. Um, but there was a report that they have reached an agreement in conference committee, um, but there was no language yet. So um, I'm just going on a report that there might be a vote soon. <laughs> and the Gazette reported on it. Mm -hmm. And if they know <laughs> that's really happening. Um, so, so given that, again, I'm kind of looking at Chris. Um, there are a number of aspects of this of this bylaw proposal that that makes sense if you know even if it's um even if it's a small project so the question is um you know how much as we go through this how much is actually inappropriate for a small project we doesn't seem like we would craft an entirely different section or article for small ground mounted projects well, 25 megawatts is really big. The um, project that's proposed for Shootsbury Road, I think is nine something megawatts. So 25 megawatts is more than two and a half times bigger than that. So I guess, um, what am I saying? I think it's still gonna be necessary for us to have submittal requirements unless the state totally preempts yeah. us and you know, gives us submittal requirements for different scales of um, arrays. So I, I think I agree with Mandy Joe that we should just leave this for now and deal with it later. Jennifer. Uh, this is just a question um, you know, for my own information, but if the state does provide submittal requirements, do we still have to decide where we want it in our bylaw? We won't know until we see what the state is proposing. But is it still our decision where we put it? Like we were just deciding, should it go as a standalone in the planning board and the ZBA? I guess that's where I'm a little confused. Do we still have to make that decision? Well, no matter. The state will it will tell us what the submittal requirements are, but do we still have to decide where it goes in our bylaw? I don't think it would go in our bylaw or in rules and regs. It would be a oh, state Oh, I see. It would just law. be a state. It would be a it state be law. Yeah, it, and, and that's why okay. I say it, if it's a got state it. law, it, we shouldn't spend any time on it. Time on it. It doesn't have to go. We don't put here. it in. It just exists on its it own. It just exists. Law. Yeah. And if, okay. it, if that doesn't, then <laughs> maybe we deal with it and discuss where it goes. Right. Okay. But Never mind. We've got so Thanks. much else to cover. This one seems like. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I just, I was just confused. I thought it still had to go in here someplace, but it won't. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And Stephanie. Um, sorry, I'm actually maybe backtracking a little bit, That's but okay. I think the comment was made that something about an applicant comes and looks at the bylaw and has all the information they need. And I don't think at all that that's true about bylaws. Um, you know, quite often there's rules and regulations that are separate. I'm thinking, of course, what I know, the wetlands um, bylaw, 
is it's very general. You're talking about the sort of basic things that you're protecting and what they are and where they are, but you're not defining the requirements of like what you have to do to protect them. That's in the regulations. And because and the reason for that is because they regulations are often changed for various reasons. And it's so that you don't have to go back to a much cumbersome process to amend the bylaw itself. It's much easier to amend regulations. So I think when someone says that, that everything should be in the bylaw, then they're maybe not completely understanding what a bylaw is and that the rules and regulations are important to accompany that um, and they can be changed. When I looked, one of the one of the charges from the staff was to say, so many of these submittal requirements may be redundant with ZBA and planning board. And when I went to look at ZBA and planning board, I mean, a lot of their rules and regs are, you know, how many people need to attend the meeting and, you know, all they're just administrative junk. Um, the, the list of submittal like physical requirements, site plans, condition plans, all that um, is certainly valid, but there still seem to be a number of items that um, that are pretty much germane only to solar bylaw because it's it's such an industrial uh, it's such an industrial production that is quite different from the normal ZBA you know house lots and and those kinds of that kind of scale of the work. So I looked at, you know, I was thinking we don't usually ask the ZBA doesn't ask about maintaining farmland, farm roads or something like that. They um, they they don't really talk about looking at characteristics and, and extent of land cover types, for instance, they that's just not something that they're looking for or typically even soil stockpile locations or, um, and yes, they do ask for signing and fencing and stormwater management plans, but there's some pretty specific ones, stormwater management, for instance, that is really specific to, to the runoff from panels. So those are the kinds of things that felt like we still needed to cover some of those bases. Chris. So I think what we would have to do is have a separate section on submittal requirements for solar arrays. And I'm I'm remembering now that um, I think the submittal requirements for the zoning board and the planning board may actually be in their application, um, in their application description mm -hmm. and not so much in their rules and regs. So we'll have to study that a bit. But okay. uh, yeah, so uh, having a separate section on what is required over and above what we normally require for other types of um, proposals. That's how we would handle it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that, that makes some sense that it's in their application section. Yeah. Okay, well, I had some great ideas for this section, but if we're not gonna talk about it, we'll just move on to another one. <laughs> okay. So does everybody feel comfortable moving on to the next section, 1705? So this is design standards. And and we can we we have um, we have the staff comments, access roads, um, and public access consultation. Are these consistent with existing regulations, i.e., zoning, fire, and DPW? I was think that, that was the staff. That was the staff comment. Councillor Haneke, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, I I had a question about the title and then application of this section to BESS systems. Go ahead. Uh, basically, this is titled for only LGPI, although it mm -hmm. large it refers to it wrong. Um, 
and it doesn't mention Bess at all. And are we trying to in this do designs like should we be including Bess in certain sections of this when it makes sense um or not like access roads seems like one that could apply to both lgpi and Bess potentially um but as written only applies to lgpi chris i'm going to go to you first so we could add something that says and associated BESS, because I think the intention is for standalone BESS, we want to have a separate section of the bylaw. But for BESS that is associated with a solar array, this would apply. So if we added the phrase and associated BESS after the word arrays, I think that might cover it. Mm -hmm. You okay with that, Mandy? You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank I you. Just have to process how that works for each of these sections coming below. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I, or if, you know, associated best where appropriate. And I don't think we need to say that we're at, in every, at every turn. Right. Yeah, like I said, I, I think that works for the title. I'm just, as we go through, I'm gonna have to process. So Stephanie, maybe you can remind us why the, the staff were talking about I don't know what the word consultation means. Access road consultation. Are these consistent with other regular? Oh, is this is this making sure fire and DPW get to take a look at these roads for accessibility and meeting their requirements? Yeah, I think they were trying to make a point that they would be in compliance with you know with local. Um, local regulation and guidance. So I think that's what they were trying to get to here. So yes, you would be ensuring that um, you'd be in compliance with their standards design. So the you wanna make sure that you're in compliance with the fire department's design standards. Yes. And do we say that it says they'll be planned and constructed in consultation with town engineer? We don't specifically say to their standards. I think they were saying instead of consultation, I think what they wanted you to say was in compliance with. Okay, great. With the town engineer, fire department, and shall be planned and constructed to minimize grading, stormwater runoff, removal of walls and trees, and to minimize impacts. Great. Um, it, it does make sense to me. In compliance with the town engineer? No, no, no. In compliance with <laughs> um, local and state design standards and regulations, I think instead of so in, instead of saying consultation with the town engineer, the fire department, Department of Public Works, you're saying that they're construct designed, sorry, planned and constructed in compliance with local and state design standards and regulations. And local implies fire department, DPW. That makes sense. So am I then deleting everything else? Um, I believe I have a comment that says delete, yes. Even, but, e excuse me, even where it says planned and constructed to minimize grading stormwater runoff and removal of mm -hmm. stormwater and trees, I think we should leave that in. Yeah, I do too. Leave I can up, up to public works, delete that, and then leave the rest in, in my opinion. So Chris, I can tell you the reason why they said that was because local regulation addresses those things. Okay. But not removal of stone walls and trees. Or minimizing impacts to natural and cultural resources. Those, I think, all, I agree, they would be good to keep in. 
So I have some questions about this. Um, I, I'm not sure we need to repeat the to minimize because it's right here. Um, so that seems superfluous to me, but um, how is minimizing removal of, I, I guess, how is this measurable? Um, and does anywhere else in our zoning bylaw require such um, construction to minimize removal of stone walls and trees and impacts and all, or is that new to this particular use? I'm gonna look at Chris, I have a comment. I think in general, the boards do look at minimizing these things. Um, and maybe it's not exactly written down, but those are things, those are items that they consider when they're reviewing proposals. Mm -hmm. So it would ordinarily be done, whether it's stated or not. So how do you measure whether it's been minimized, shall be constructed to minimize? How do you because... measure that? <laughs> Stephanie and then Pam. <laughs> I, I just wanted to um, echo what Councillor Henneke is saying is that is precisely what staff was referring to that point that when you have these, um, you can, you don't, when you have them sort of blanketly stated as you're minimizing, you don't have any measurement or standard to do so and you don't have any way to measure what that is. And I think that's why they were saying you should do this work in compliance with local and state design standards and regulations, because as Chris Brestrup pointed out, in review, those things tend to come out during review. So it's not that there's no consideration of these features or aspects of a development. Thank you, Chris. So I also wanted to mention, I agree with what Stephanie said, and it's okay to take out what's there in the black lettering, but um, I wanted to mention the fact that the reason that we have um, proposals go before a zoning board of appeals or a planning board is because they use their good judgment in deciding whether something is minimally graded or has a minimal impact on stormwater runoff. They listen to the applicant, they listen to abutters, they listen to expert testimony, and then they decide whether something is done appropriately or not. And not everything is necessarily measurable. And if it were, then all we would need is a list of rules and regulations. And we wouldn't need these things to go to a board because <clears throat> there wouldn't be any need for judgment. It would just all be black and white. So I'm just um, putting in a plug for leaving in some language that is not absolutely black and white. Mm -hmm. I would say, as somebody who had to develop drawings for this kind of thing, not for solar fields, but but there are there are careful grading plans and there are sloppy grading plans and there are ways to literally to minimize the the excavation of soil and the and the importation of soil so that you are doing the least change to the ground and you look at the plans and you can see if they have in fact done a a if they have minimized the grading i mean you can you 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 can do it many different ways and you, and you pick the one that that is the minimal impact it's it's pretty darn measurable So, so how are people feeling about leaving in the, the letters in black to be planned and constructed to minimize grading, stormwater runoff, removal of stone walls and trees, and to minimize impacts to natural or cultural resources? I think Jennifer. they should stay. I think they should stay too. I don't also feel comfortable saying we'll leave it up to the wisdom of the board, because then why have... <laughs> You know, that's very subjective. So I, I would sure. feel like to see it remain. Mandy has her hand up. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I 
I don't like how subjective it is. I get at, for particular ones, I can understand how you can determine it for grading and maybe even stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. But I have a real problem with minimize removal of trees because the way you do that is not construct. <laughs> you know, like, like how does some, well, if you take three panels out, you, re you remove less trees. Well, if you take a half, half of your plan out, you remove even less trees. If it's, if it's in a forest, like, like how do you measure the minimizing of removal of trees? It It's, it, you know, and I guess this is this is related to access roads, right? How do you so so think about that um, instead of a whole project? So I apologize on that one. Um, but minimizing the removal of trees for an access road might require doubling the size of the access road or moving it to a spot that's actually not logical. Um, I those those the stone walls trees and natural and cultural resources ones don't sit as well with me as the grading and stormwater runoff do um from a how do you make a decision on that uh pat and then St and then stephanie basically mandy i would reverse what you're saying because there may be a great deal of logic in maintaining this small group of trees and it the road becomes more efficient. Um, so I think that removing the number of trees, we're not talking now about clear cutting, we're talking about uh, <laughs> something like the Merry Maple, but in the, you know, on an access road and 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 curving the access road to the left 100 feet or 50 feet or 10 feet or or something like that i think that those things should be there i think that there are natural and cultural resources that are real um and and that we need to pay some attention to them it doesn't stop um a project it does allow us to say hey if you do this you're saying, no, it's going to make it worse. And I'm going to say, no, it minimizes. That's, again, subjective. And so much of this is this kind of thing. But I think it belongs there. Thank you. Stephanie Sounds like was we going have, to say we... something I thought. Hmm? I, I took my hand down, but I, and I was not going to say something. But actually, I am going to say something. Um, <laughs> Well, I guess the point is that when you hand this, when you complete this and you hand it to staff, staff is then tasked with working with boards and committees to enforce these things. And I think if they're written in such a way that we can't, you know, it's going to make it really challenging if it's very sort of vague language. You know, that's why staff is saying, you know, there's very specific things. If you Again, I'm I'm sorry that I keep going to the wetlands regulations, but it's what I know and it's what I worked with for 14 years. Very specific, very specific language about what you're clearing, how much you're clearing, and there's local guidance, you know, there's local and state guidance for that. So I would I would just push back that this was um a very strongly felt opinion about this and the I think the you know the folks that are mostly dealing with this are the ones who sort of came up with this language. Um, so I just I just want to offer that once again um, as a perspective. Thank you. Um, it, it occurred to me that the two the two um, perspectives that were that were actually kind of blending in this one paragraph is that we have we have a ZBA who are lay people who are going to be doing setting conditions and things like that, they may or may not know if the stormwater or the um, impacts have been, have been minimized. They will certainly be able to see if stone walls have been removed and they can look at the, they can look at the before and after planting plan or, or forest cover map and they'll see sort of the extent of trees that are removed. 
Um, and, and then you're saying though, at the same time, you're going to have professional review of each and every project. Are we going to assume that, uh, you know, DPW or, or let's say, um, wetland administrator is going to actually spell out that they need to, they need to work harder to minimize grading, um, and then that will be a condition that the that the CONCOM or the planning board or ZBA then adopts. It's it's putting a lot of the burden on the staff. And and I think Pat's point was, but we want to be able to lead the the ZBA members to uh refresh their memory, remind them what they should be considering. How about we leave it in for now with a note? Oh, Dave, hi. You raised your hand. Yeah, um, I'm not arguing pro or con on this. Just in response to what you just said, Pam, I mean, to some degree, that's exactly what staff do, right? I mean, so we do a review. We, meaning staff in conservation and development, collectively or individually, we do a review of every project that comes through the town. So you reference, say, the wetlands administrator, if there are natural, if there are um, regulated uh, resource areas on a particular site, yes, Aaron Jock would comment. And so I, I guess our roles as staff are to advise ZBA planning board Concom, if we're talking just about those three for now. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's any way to avoid that. I think what Stephanie was getting at was, and I was at some of those meetings where staff were commenting on the, the draft bylaw, is, you know, how can we be more specific? Can those things be measurable? And I think that's where the struggle is in the second part of this. Um, but we're already doing that. We're already, you know, Yes, we have some lay people on each one of those uh, boards and committees, but some of them are professionals in their field. I'm thinking of the Conservation Commission right now um, has two uh, natural resource planners, wetlands experts on, on the commission right now, and they're experts in their own right. So they know all about um, you know, minimizing impacts and um, uh, 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 stormwater, et cetera. So anyway, I'm not arguing either way. I'm just saying... Mm -hmm. This is what this is what we do, and and we will continue to advise those boards and committees on this once this is adopted. Thank you, um, Pat. And then I, I'm going to make a suggestion. Yeah, just really quickly, and this is just for my own head right now. We were we took out fire department and Department of Public Works, uh, and we are standing with local and state design standards. Um, but in in moving into a forest or moving up an access road into the into the woods to get to a large scale uh, something like Shutesbury Road, what isn't there a kind of uniqueness that the fire department, the the chief or whoever is the strategist, uh, should be looking what that I guess I'm trying to figure out would would state regulations really cover Mm -hmm. an intricate new way into a forest or or onto a landfill or whatever. Uh, so I'm wondering whether or not I st I would feel better that I, there was some sense that the fire department uh, strategists have looked at this. And, I, and not, I'm not saying, I'm, but listening to the rest of your argument, I'm trying to figure this one out for myself. Thank you. Somebody can. Thank you, Pat. Chris, Jennifer, and then I'm going to try to wrap that up. Okay, so I think this is pretty standard language. If they're, if the bulk of people here want to take it out, that's okay with me, yeah. but I, I don't think it's going to hurt anything, and it is very standard language. The second thing is the town engineer, the fire department, and the Department of Public Works all are asked to look at all planning board and CBA applications. So they will naturally be invited to make comments. So I don't think we have to have those groups enumerated. So Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's helpful to me. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, I'm just repeating what I said before, but I would feel more comfortable keeping this in 
because I mean, there are boards and committees that don't have <laughs> kind of a diversity of perspectives. We hope that they do, but they don't always. So I think including this is the full picture of what they should look at can't hurt and it might help. Thank you. So I'm I'm going to suggest that we keep it in for now and we make a note and just say, please revisit this. We've heard some really good perspectives and there may be additional material in the rest of the document that in fact supports or or is redundant with what we're asking for here. So um, that was a very good conversation about it. But I think I, I don't want to spend more time on that particular item tonight. Uh, it's about 20 of eight. Oh, Councillor Haneke, I don't think you can see her hand. Oh, I can't. <laughs> Sorry. In front of me so I can see it. <laughs> I, I just want to revisit one thing on this one. I still believe the second to minimize is redundant. Um, that it can read without changing anything, um, shall be planned and construction, constructed to minimize grading, yeah. stormwater runoff, removal of stone walls and trees, and impacts to natural cultural resources. I agree. So I'd like to delete that. Perfect. Uh, and as far as the other the other two items under roads, um, I'm I'm very supportive of keeping in that line about existing farm roads, because if there is an existing farm road, it means that they don't have to excavate and plow up another section for creating a similar access point. Mandy. So I actually agree with Stephanie to delete both. Um, although I was willing to keep potentially the repair to damage public roads, but I'd like to hear Stephanie's thoughts on or indication as to why staff said delete both but existing farm round roads shall be maintained in stable condition that's whether or not another access road is being built or not it doesn't say if it's being used or not or you can't if you have an existing farm road you can't build another access road i find it a very strange requirement that I don't think we require on any other zoning bylaw that if a road exists that you must continue to maintain that road in perpetuity on your own private land. So I find that very strange. And then I also have a question about the title of this section, access roads, roads and public access. Yeah, we're not I really think talking we about- do, We should delete everything after access roads because it's talking about in theory, access roads. Um, I don't understand what public access is at all in this section. And I, that part at most, um, at, at minimum, I think needs deleted too. Chris. I believe that this section, um, existing farm roads shall be maintained in a stable condition. I think that relates to, um, when you use farmland to install a large scale, um, ground mounted solar array that you want to maintain the farm road that's already there so that when the property goes back to farming later on in 20 or 40 years that road will still be there so if you wanted to keep that sentence in there you might want to make reference to for solar arrays installed on you know farmland and that's all i'm going to say Uh, let's see, Stephanie. Um, first point, I just want to say that these are not my comments. These are the staff comments. I was just typing. So <laughs> I don't want to take credit for all of them. Um, but I will say again that I think the the um, pushback from staff for these two lines uh, were also, again, about being measurable. And also, uh, especially with damage to public roads, that there's other um, regulation that would enforce these kinds of impacts. So I think, again, they were feeling like either it was measurable, it needed to be measurable, or that there's already existing legislation, local legislation, if you will, that will cover some of these things. I have a question for Chris, and that is, um, do our normal uh, construction conditions require that uh, construction vehicles, you know, there's protection at the entrance of the site. Is there some statement already that um, trucks on public roads 
and projects will repair damage. I think if we already have it, we probably don't need that sentence. We don't really have it, but it is included in conditions a lot of times. Um, and it's especially true in downtown locations where um, trucks are going over sidewalks and things, and um, they are then, there's a condition placed that whatever damage is done to the public right of way needs to be um, repaired at the end of the project. So, um, but this may be too broad here because repair damage to public roads, how, how long does that go? Is it like a mile worth of roadway? It's not a specific location like we have for downtown locations. Um, so I, I'm not supporting or not supporting this uh, being left in. I always envisioned this as at the main entrance to a site that that there's care taken that the pavement isn't broken up and you know just from trucks turning and carrying heavy loads um could we say something like she'll be required to repair damage to public roads um that mandy has her hand up thank you i was in the middle of a sentence <laughs> but man let's, let's, let's go let's go to me done, dear one what I thought you were done. No, I was pausing and thinking. Sorry. Mandy, go ahead. Um, I was going to, uh, for that sentence, the public road one, It that one in particular, but even the next one, seem like conditions on a permit, not an actual design standard. What standard does someone propose to meet this? You know, um, if we're, you know, this is all under section 70, 1705 design standards. That's like, how do you design your project on your parcel? And this sentence about repairing damage to public roads has nothing to do with the design of the project at all. Um, maybe existing farm roads maintained in stable condition does a little bit, but not really the, you know, existing farm roads shall, you know, or, you know, um, access roads or whatever, or a project shall be planned and constructed um, to minimize impacts to existing farm roads might be a design condition, but the maintenance of them, the required maintenance of it doesn't seem like a design standard. It seems like a condition of some sort and the repair of roads seems like a condition, not a design standard on for how the project is designed and cited. Would it help if it said, uh, existing farm rooms shall be maintained in a stable condition during the project construction? That's still like a yeah. condition, mm -hmm. not a design. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, so Chris, can can that be added as a condition? We we didn't actually develop a a list of conditions, but maybe we could note that particular item or two and and talk about um, potential condition standard condition. Yes. So let's go back to the title: access roads, roads and public access. I agree with Mandy. There is no public access unless it's allowed by the developer. Um, um, well, we're not getting rid of it. We're just saying that perhaps they are. I was thinking if you add it to conditions, you don't keep it here. Sorry, I will undelete the deletion. Yeah, we don't have a place to plop conditions yet. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. I just wanted to remind you, and I don't know if it's relevant, but way back in the beginning, we did actually um, create a draft conditions document mm -hmm. so that the things that were taken out of the bylaw had somewhere to be. So there were companion documents. And so I just wanted to remind you of that. Thank you. Yes, we did that. Right. <clears throat> we may need to resurrect it. 
Does anyone else want to keep the word roads in this little title? Yes, no. I, I mean, mean, it's really just dealing with access roads. Yes, it is really dealing with access roads. Yeah. So I think just that. Yeah. Remove. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we move to fencing? So the comment here is that the, the fence being knuckled selvage um, is, is pretty darn specific. Um, I understand the reasoning because you don't want people or critters ripping their clothing or their or their underbellies if they're trying to jump over the fence or crawl under it. Um, does anyone have a strong feeling about about it? Mandy, go ahead. I had a potential rewrite because I didn't like the speci specificity of this. <laughs> like it, it seems to be very specific. So I had a, the fence material shall be approved by the PGA is how Great. I rewrote that sentence. Great. <laughs> um, and then the next sentence, I was concerned with the shall be at least six to eight inches above the ground. Yes. That's a range. <laughs> well, then let's let's make it one or it, the other. I would say at least six. Um, the lower of them, right? Like, yes, uh, is how I had suggested to getting rid of the two eight. Um, I I I would agree. At least six inches above the ground. They can decide if they want it to be higher. So I did check with the biologist in the family, and six inches would accommodate everything probably but coyotes and bears. Uh, getting into this you know, fenced area. So here we have fencing shall not include barbed wire. Um, is that something that Pat, you're you're muted. Pat, Pat, muted. you're muted. I'm not agreeing to the removal of knuckled selvage. I think because it says unless determined otherwise by the PGA. So mm -hmm. I don't see a problem. If it 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 isn't necessary, then the PGA can to change it. Mm -hmm. How many uh, plan, uh, people on the planning board or the ZBA know what even know what knuckled selvage is? Uh, I would like to keep it small disagreement, but an important one. Can I ask a question about that? And then I've got a comment on barbed wire. Sure. If it is worded the way it was originally worded, is that technically a special permit approval to change from knuckled selvage to something else because it's sort of a waiver of the knuckled selvage requirement um, versus a material shall be approved by the PGA being just part of the site plan review or the, it is, I guess, is it a separate special permit to change the material? Um, I'm mm. trying to figure out what the difference might be if you've said something and then said, unless they do otherwise. Um, I still think we should never get this specific. We don't tell houses what type of fencing they must use. Um, and wildlife are in all sorts of things. Um, so I, I think it's inappropriate to get that specific. But I'm curious if there's a difference in language on how a permit is approved. Chris. And then, oh, and then when I get an answer, I'll talk about barbed wire. Chris. So it would be approved as part of the main special permit for the installation as a whole. It's just another thing that the board or committee, board, planning board or ZBA would approve as part of its um, complete review of the project. So it doesn't need a special permit, another, a special, special permit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question on barbed wire, I understand 
the potential desire on barbed wire to say no to it because it can be damaging. Um, but if there is associated battery storage, you might want barbed wire at the top to keep people from getting in and climbing the fence. Um, if, if I remember correctly, the fencing around on College Street around the Eversource substation has a barbed wire top. And that seems entirely logical for certain types of installations. And this would prevent you from doing barbed wire to, in some sense, keep people from climbing the fence um, when you might not want people climbing the fence. So I, I didn't like that wording of you can never have it when we're thinking about mm -hmm. a situation where other electrical settings have fencing that includes barbed wire. Thank you. Um, let's see, Chris, you had your hand up. What if you said, unless approved by the PGA, fencing shall not include barbed mm -hmm. wire unless approved by the PGA? And then in a certain instance, it may be useful to have barbed yeah. Mandy, do you want to add that in? Did we lose our scribe? There we go. No, I'm trying to do 12 things at once. I'm looking at the fences <laughs> section in the zoning bylaw. That's yeah, that's often height. They've had we're not lim I don't think we're we do actually we do limit height to eight feet, right? Somewhere in here. Height is generally limited to six feet unless it's an agricultural installation or unless you have special permission. Oh yeah, there it is. Yep. This one says eight feet for fencing. So that must be something that's particular to solar installations. It's more of keep people out of an industrial zone. Okay, so how do we have it here? We have the need for fencing determined by the applicant, um, no more than eight feet. The fence material shall be, um, shall we go back to knuckled salvage? Can we just say chain link unless determined otherwise by the PGA? Pat. Dave hand Dave had his hand up. Pat. Oh, Dave had his hand up too. Thank you. Oh, let's go. Let's go to Pat. She put it I'm up. I'm just saying that knuckled, knuckled salvage should be there. Let's let's put it back in and we can always come back to this. Dave. One, I had a question for for Pat. Pat, could you say a little bit more about why you think it should be that type of fencing? I feel strongly that we need to protect as much wildlife as possible, and I think that that would help. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way that you can have something built in the woods um, or even on farmland um, where that isn't true. And in terms of uh, bylaws for housing or housing development, Mandy, perhaps maybe we should hope that where you're near the woods or something like that, maybe there should be knuckled salvage there. I think using that as uh, um, a marker for removing something because we don't do it with a housing project um, is not, is not, uh, it's not evenly balanced. Yeah, the two things I was going to add. One is I like what Chris said about fencing shall not be shall not include barbed wire unless approved by the PGA. I was thinking of a situation where I think normally, you know, unless it is well, in normal situations, I think we'd probably all agree that we we would not like to see barbed wire on the top of these these fences. 
but there might be a situation where a solar developer develops, you know, X solar solar field and then encounters a lot of vandalism and needs to add that. And if it's added in the future and if it's prohibited from doing that, this would give them the option unless approved, you know, and the PGA could revisit that later. The other thing, Randy, and I don't know the answer to this, but it strikes me that we have two obligations. One is to help the solar developer protect their investment on the site, but also protect those members of the public from getting into places where they may get hurt. So I don't know on College Street, well, let me back up. I don't know, you know, I don't, anybody can get hurt on one of these solar sites, but how, how difficult is it to get into the apparatus, both the batteries and any kind of other uh, electrified, you know, the panels themselves versus your example on College Street, where I think it probably is much easier to actually get potentially electrocuted on College <laughs> Street. But anyway, it struck me that it's like protecting the investment of, of the solar company, but also protecting the public if for instance, people get in there or young people get in there and are exploring a little bit, either they go over or under, you know, we want to protect them. So. Mandy. To... So knuckled selvage chain link is a very specific type of fence, a wooden rail fence. I'm not saying a developer would choose to do that would not harm wildlife. A, um, a metal vertical slat fence would not harm wildlife. Knuckled selvage is not the only thing you can use to protect wildlife. Um, from being injured. And so I just don't understand. I'm looking at the fence regulations here and in Agricultural uses on parcels of land five acres or larger, that's the only place they talk about fencing material, and it uses the phrase razor fences are prohibited. Um, and so looking at, uh, I've sort of moved on to a different topic, but looking at consistency across bylaws, here we're re referencing barbed wires. Um, should we actually say something like razor fences are prohibited unless whatever in to keep the language similar? Um, and then I actually had a question about all the language. Unless otherwise permitted by the PGA is two paragraphs above this. Um, this one is unless approved by the PGA. Um, what language should we use for the unless whatever? And we need to be consistent as to which language that is so that uh, amongst all of this, um, those are my three comments. Does anyone have a preference on the unless permitted by the PGA? I mean, we say that we say that a lot throughout this right. and other and other documents, and the PGA always has some flexibility, especially the ZBA. No, I just want to make sure we rep, we say it the same way every time. And I Oops. don't. I'm trying to find one in the current bylaw. Maybe we should leave that for GOL. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> the more we do it now, the easier it is to get through GOL. I know. I was just trying to lighten the mood, dear. I want to make a note while while she's actually looking that up. It is uh, eight oh six, and I just wanted to. Uh, I did. I did alert that there might be a approximately at eight eight p.m. specifically on solar bylaw topics, public comment period. So I'm going to pause for a minute and open up this to public comment. We will come back and resume the conversation um, after that. Let's just see if I can find people. We have two, we have two attendees. I'm opening up 
the comments, public comments to the audience. And if you would like to speak to this topic specifically, um, you're welcome to do so. And it will be for two minutes and you can give your name and address, please. I'm seeing no one clamoring to get in. Okay, public public comment period number two closed. Um, let's see where were we? We lost our we lost our text. Great, thank you. Okay, so Mandy, you were looking for other uh, applications of or allowed by the PGA, correct? Yes, um, I found one so far. It's hard to scan this quickly. Um, and it said something like, where was it? Um, unless allowed by the PGA. That's it. So um, I, I frankly a completely like, different wording in general, unless allowed. <laughs> I, I frankly like le uh, uh, unless approved. That's just a little more formal and finite. I think the otherwise might be important. I don't know. I'm comfortable with that. Anybody feel strongly that that otherwise, as uh, unless otherwise permitted or approved, excuse me, by the PGA. Great, good. Okay, glare, we're moving to glare. And I think there was comment by staff again that the it is um, not measurable and can't be determined. Um, yet we have, Stephanie, go ahead. It wasn't the whole statement. It was just um, uh, to the point where in that second paragraph, you have from becoming a public nuisance or hazard to adjacent buildings, roadways, or properties, that that specific language was not measurable and can't be determined. I just want to be clear. Mm, okay. So I'm thinking of Route Two as you drive east in the morning, and you come to the uh, you come to the reservoir, and it is a sheet of glare across the water. Um, we're really talking about reflected brilliance, and I think the the reason to have something about glare is is um, to make sure that we're, it's properly screened. Stephanie. I apologize, I didn't take my hand down. Oh, Sorry. that's okay. Okay. So right now it just says, the design of the installation shall prevent reflected solar radiation or glare. Um, what about saying to the extent feasible or something like that? Mandy, you have your hand up. Um. Yeah, a, a couple of things. And then I wanted, sorry, to go back to the highlighted language and fencing. Um, and I apologize for that. But um, these three separate paragraphs seem to be saying some of the same thing in a slightly different but somewhat repetitive manner, um, except for this one sentence here about the applicant should submit ratings and technical, isn't that more of an application requirement and not something that should be in design standards? Um, that's more of a technical thing. So I would delete that sentence completely. I would actually, I think, delete um, the first paragraph and the third paragraph. Um, design efforts may include, well, why? It seems to me that 
the owner and applicant should be able to determine what design efforts they include and we shouldn't tell them what they have to include in their efforts. Um, that they should be smart enough and savvy enough to figure out what things they can do to um, minimize reflectivity um, that we don't have to tell them. Um, so I think glare is an issue because there's not really glare, they're not producing light. The panels don't produce light, the panels reflect light. Um, right. And so I think the first sentence isn't accurate. The second sentence is a, is a application thing, um, submittal requirement potentially. The design of the installation shall, shall prevent re reflected solar radiation or glare. I think you could just say, if we like the minimized language, that, that sentence could just read, the design of the installation shall um, seek to minimize um, or shall minimize um, the reflect reflected, well, well, shall minimize reflectivity into residences or onto public ways or something like that. Use the reflectivity language. Um, I'm not sure reflectivity is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> or, but, or, per, you know, minimize reflected. I, I don't understand solar radiation. Maybe that's that, that would be the heat. That that's the, the heat, heat not the. the not the light, right? And we're looking to minimize the reflected light, not heat. Um, buildings, roadways, or properties. Properties is very general. Um, I think we should be more specific on where the reflection going to needs minimized. Um, do you have to minimize it back up? Do you have to minimize it into windows? Which windows? Um, onto other properties, but a property that is unoccupied without a building, do you really need to minimize the reflection? So I, I think this this one, to, to say it shorter, it needs a lot of work and needs more specificity. Let's Let's make a note of that. Oh, sorry, two hands up, Jennifer and then Pat. Yeah, I I <clears throat> feel like this is wordsmithing. I mean, I think um, residents and members of the public, but if you're abutting a large scale solar installation, glare seems to be a major concern that can adversely impact abutters. So I think it's important that this be clear and it's in this, it, it's, not that specific. I mean, I just don't have a problem with the first, if you want it, the LG, LGPI shall be positioned to minimize glare on any residence or public way. Now, maybe that next sentence doesn't have to be in this section, but then the design of the installation shall prevent reflected solar radiation or glare from becoming a, I, I like that. Um, if it's an empty building, then I, it's not, you know, um, a, ha a public nuisance. I mean, I, you know, just think it's making clear that this is, this is very important to people <laughs> that are adjacent to large scale ground mounted solar installations. And I think that makes it very clear that the glare is something that the permit granting authority needs to be attuned to and seek to minimize. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, I don't think it's worded in a way that's onerous. And it's important, so it might be a little onerous, but that's just. Pat, and then Stephanie. Yeah, since this is an unusual event, I have to agree with uh, Jennifer. And I put my hand down because she's basically saying what I would have said. It, it is a design issue to minimize glare on any residence or the public way if possible. Uh, if I go back to the proposal for the eruptor lab and the butters were very clear that they wanted the lighting, uh, the, they were concerned about glare. And, and so they had the design, uh, the designers chose to have certain kind of lighting and how where they aim the lighting. 
no, this is not, this is, there are plenty, and I, I hate using the Shootsbury Road project, but I'm going to, there are houses around that, and and mm -hmm. literally, the, it, it is possible that they would be affected uh, by by glare or, or uh, so I think that we have to, it is a design standard and it needs to be there. I agree that uh, I don't know, I don't know whether the submit ratings and technical specifications is important. And I would uh, ask Stephanie or, or Chris about that or Dave. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so I think I will just get back to the point of the very specific language that staff objected to, which was um, glare becoming a public nuisance or hazard to adjacent buildings, roadways, or properties. Again, it, how are you how how are you measuring that? Like what's the threshold? Where what standard are you using to determine what that is? So it's not to say that you wouldn't regulate for these things, but to have this language in the bylaw, there's no way to specifically enforce that. And I think that's what staff was pushing back on. And again, these were not my, just my comments. And there was agreement amongst several other staff members about this particular language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was, I was thinking that, um, and it, go ahead, Jennifer. I, I kind of lost my train of thought. No, I was just wondering, I wanted to ask Stephanie, I mean, is there, in terms of a public hazard, I'm just, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have that much uh, familiarity with large scale solar arrays, but could you be draw? is there a standard of glare that would make it hazardous for cars driving by because it would be blinding? I mean, is there mm -hmm. any you know, sort of objective measurement of glare that would be a hazard? I would defer to Chris as to that kind of a standard. I'm not personally aware, but I would defer to Chris. If, if, that, something. if that is even a... Um, so Chris a and then... Sorry, Chris and then Mandy had her hand up, I think. I'm not familiar with any regulations that make a, a any kind of criteria or specific, specificity about glare, but I think it's one of those things that you know when it's happening. Yeah. And so um, I, I think that the engineers who design these projects can um, do calculations and learn about whether their installation has the potential for creating glare because they obviously know what angle these things have to be placed at, where the sun's coming from, et cetera. So I think they can make good educated um, surmises about whether glare is going to be a problem or not. So I think it's a good idea to have something like that in here, whether or not it's, you know, measurable by us. It would be measurable by the engineers. Um, thank you. I just want to add before I call on Dave, um, I was going to say we should just double check that they, in fact, are providing uh, sun angle diagrams when they submit their proposal. Um, it's be fairly easy to do. They've, they've done exactly what Chris said. They have their angles all set up. They know the sun angles and um, they can, knowing that they need to minimize reflection from these panels into neighboring properties, um, uh, I think is really important to keep. Dave. Yeah, no, um, I was just trying to get back to even the first sentence. I agree with Mandy that I think, I, I think this section needs to be consolidated, reworked a little bit. And I think there are ways to achieve everything that I'm hearing from folks. Um, and I understand the LGPI, it's a, you know, if if you have trackers, which most of the new ones do, positioned is the right word, but I was struggling with that, the use of that word a little bit. And I was like, should this really say the LGPI shall be designed and constructed to minimize glare? And maybe I'm just mm -hmm. getting stuck on that word positioned because that to me is the position of the tracker you know, uh, and oh, yeah. not all of these have trackers, but 
most of the newer ones we're seeing, you know, have trackers. And then I was saying to minimize glare on any residence, why wouldn't we say building or because hypothetically it could be a building that has businesses in it or, or you know, and, and whether it's occupied or not really doesn't matter. Um, so I don't know. I was just trying to broaden that a little bit to minimize glare on any structure, any any building or public way um, to see if we could capture a little bit more. But, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Mandy's had her hand up for a long time. Oh, okay, sorry. I was actually waiting for her cursor to show up on the, to add the the uh, structure. Mandy. So. Structure may be too broad, by the way. I mean, you know, if there's a, if there's a, um, a cell phone tower, that's a structure. And we don't, mm -hmm. I don't think we really care if there's glare on a cell phone structure. Yeah. Um, glare, intense and blinding light um, emitted by a light source that reduces visibility and causes visual discomfort. Glare is light, blinding light that is emitted by a light source. These panels do not emit light. Glare is the wrong thing to be talking about. Reflection of light where a ray of light bounces back from a smooth sur surface. What we should be talking about is reflection of light. So the title should be reflection of light and the LGB LGPI should be designed and constructed to minimize reflection of light onto any residence or any building or, you know, a building or public way, although any is kind of big versus um, a budding. I, I don't know. Um, but it it's not glare we're talking about here. Glare is under the lighting where we want lights dark sky compliant. Um, we're talking here about reflection of light. And I don't see if we revised like, uh, sentence number one, I don't understand why paragraph two is even necessary. Shall one the, so the second sentence says shall prevent, and the other one's the first one says shall minimize. But glare can come from reflected light. Right. I, I just Googled it. I don't know about I it's only Google, but it says glare is focused on brightness from light sources. Okay, glare can come from many sources and it can come from direct light or reflected light. There you go. I think I would I would agree with that. That's it's such a common usage of the word glare that I think I, I don't want to get hung up on it being a light source itself. It is it's a common and, and I noticed that we took it out of our out of our um our uh, um what do you call them? Definitions. Definitions. So let's let's come back. I think I think we need to keep glare. It's a it's a known thing, and it is a major issue, or at least a concern. We don't know if it's an issue, but it is certainly a concern of abutting neighbors and and uh, use of public roads. So where do we have it? The LGPI shall be designed and constructed to minimize to minimize glare, reflected glare. on any residence or public way. And I think it's on into. Into, into any residence or public into, way. Or on, I, or, or on to. On to, I, I think it's into any residence, but the public way one I struggle with. Um, is it on to? On to. I would delete the full seconds paragraph and third paragraphs. 
I agree that the second the second sentence, the applicant should submit ratings, that does definitely needs to go in the submittal requirements. And then we have just said you're supposed to minimize so the the sec the third sentence could in fact yes go away. The last sentence, the design efforts may include, Chris, is that more of a conditions? I don't think you need the last sentence. Okay, let's get but rid of I, it. I was reminded of um, Dave's comment about, are there more buildings aside from residences, like a business or mm -hmm. a hotel or, and maybe it's any biz, any building that's occupied by people. I'm not sure exactly how to describe that, but could we say any occupied building? Into any occupied building? Something like that. Great. Okay, folks, it is 25 after eight and uh, we have gotten down to lighting. So we're going to stop here. We have lighting, screening, and planting. These are these are the screening and planting is an important element. Um, can we just make a note that this is where we left off? I will do the same on my document. So, if, Chris, sorry, didn't see your hand. Oh, I I think I said what I wanted to say. Thank oh, you. okay, thank you. Great. November 19th. So that brings us to our um, action item B, which is the University Drive overlay proposal. And we are holding our public hearing on the 12th. The um, planning board is holding its public hearing on the 30th. And the question will be as we go to future. So we are, are having no meeting on the 5th. Um, so the next meeting is literally the public hearing. I do not expect to talk about the solar bylaw that night at all. We'll hear the we'll hear the comments from the public, and um, unless I hear otherwise, unless otherwise allowed by the PGA, um, we will not plan to discuss the EU drive overlay that evening. We'll just because otherwise we would have to we would have to close the public hearing and i think there's a lot more information that we might want jennifer so does that mean the meeting after the public hearing the next meeting will discuss that as well as work on the solar bylaw um it would be it would seem to be uh, appropriate to split the conversation yes so i months ago didn't want to have a meeting on election night but actually i think it might be a great distraction if it's not <laughs> i'm serious <laughs> i'd love to be thinking about the solar bylaw instead of <laughs> watching the news but we're definitely not having a meeting in two weeks that's i didn't realize that that's so it's been canceled yeah okay yeah uh mandy um to, I was going to comment on Jennifer's question about discussing mm -hmm. after the hearing on the 12th, if we continue the hearing, we'll have to pick a date where we continue the hearing to, and we should not discuss it until the continued hearing, whenever that date would be, um, because the hearing's in progress. Yeah. And you don't discuss until the hearing's over. Um, and mm -hmm. I think Pam indicated it's likely it will probably be continued because there's going to be a lot of questions and I think there'll be a lot of questions them. from the public and and probably the the committee as well yeah so we'll have to be picking a date to continue it to if we continue it so then we could discuss the solar bylaw at the meeting after the 12th Unless yeah. we've continued the hearing to that, right? right. Okay. <laughs> but but you can, you have to you have to continue a hearing to a date certain. To, to a date certain. If it's not yeah. that date, we won't be discussing you drive, so we'll be discussing the solar bylaw. Okay. So let's just for my for my benefit. So let's say on the nineteenth or whenever our next meeting is, we we could 
start with um, uh, you drive because it would be continued to that date certain. And at whatever, an hour into it, we, if we weren't finished, we weren't discussing, we decided to, to continue it. We would continue it again to a date certain and then start our solar bylaw at say eight o'clock at night or 7.30 or something like that. Because I know Mandy, you had a couple of you had a couple of hearings, or a hearing that was along with other topics as we tried to juggle both elements. Yeah. So it's it's slow. I mean, that's the problem is you don't get to. I mean, look how long it takes us to get through five items, um, and I just feel really badly that staff has to be here as much as you're being here. So thank you. Okay. So that was that was the discussion on on um, you drive. Uh, there are no minutes to approve from previous meetings. Um, we've already talked about announcements. There's no meeting on the fifth. The extra meeting is the or the replacement meeting essentially is the twelfth, and that's the public hearing. Uh, the next agenda preview is pretty similar to that. November twelfth is a special meeting, and. Uh, there were no items anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance, and it's pretty much time to adjourn. Is anybody, you know, anxious to keep talking? I'm going to go around. I guess we're supposed to we're supposed to officially close. Uh, I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. I'll second. Uh, Pat. Aye. Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Freke. Yes. Mandy. Aye. And Pam is an aye. And thank you, Dave. Thank you, Chris, for showing up and being helpful. I love it. And thank you, Stephanie. And we we know you are the messenger in some cases. We're we're not <laughs> okay. we're not targeting the messenger. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. Nice. We'll see you in a nice. couple of weeks. Bye bye. Bye bye.